Take your Bibles and open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 23. And some of you, I understand, uh, came into the sanctuary and were not able to receive a sermon outline. Um, these are very entertaining. <laughs> designed to keep you awake and uh, allow you to have further study. So if you didn't receive one, raise your hand and our ushers will uh, find you real quick and they'll make sure that you get one. Just raise your hand up. It looks a lot like this. Poor man sitting along the curb trying to figure out what his life is all about. So just raise your hand and our ushers will, uh, will eventually find you. We're looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be between now and the, the middle part of March. We're going to be looking at uh, ways in which the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to get us to realize what life would be like if, in fact, God were not part of it. Um, we, we assume so much in our lives uh, about being people created in God's image and living in God's world, there's so many things that we just take for granted living in God's world that we just assume are just part of everybody's lives. And we don't realize how sad a, a life really is when they divorce themselves from God. How many things in their lives that are suddenly uh, no longer part of their life because they've shoved God out of their picture. And so what the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to get us to realize is what life is like without God and how life under the... the um, the sun, S-U-N, would be really meaningless, empty, futile, vain. But in doing that, and seeing, uh, taking a look at the life without God, pushing God completely out of the picture and realizing what we would not have, you begin to appreciate what you do have. Kind of like every time my wife goes away for a week and she comes back. Oh, some of you are not married yet to understand what that means. I eat better. I have someone that I can snuggle up with at night, someone that takes care of the dog. Oh no, it's not just the dog, it's the demon dog. There's so many things my wife does for me that I begin to take for granted until she's gone away. You really don't know what you've got until it's gone. And that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to get into our brains, get us to realize how much God does for us that we take for granted. In this particular time, in this particular section in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 17 through 23, he's taking a look at work and how work would be meaningless if, in fact, we didn't have someone to do it for that was eternal, if we didn't have someone to do it for that would transcend this world because Solomon's going to work all of his life and then realize, gee, I'm going to give it to my son. In fact, some of the commentators said that Solomon only had one son. Now, that seems amazing to me. With... A thousand women which he could have as a possibility of producing elspring, how could he just have one son? But there were actually several commentaries that made this reference. And I looked in the scriptures, and you really can't find any other son other than Rehoboam. Now, I don't know how much you know about Rehoboam, but here's kind of the situation that took place. Solomon works after his father David had pretty much brought uh, military peace and strategic peace to the Middle East. Solomon's now able to build on his father uh, David's conquests and really establish a whole time of peace for about 40 years in the, people, in the place of Israel where they now are able to establish economic prosperity and dominance. They're able to uh, establish um, social dominance and, and cultural dominance. They became the powerhouse of the known world at that particular time during the reign of Solomon. Silver was considered as pavement. At $32 an ounce, it's hard for me to, I don't know what the current going rate of silver is, but somewhere around $30 an ounce, it's hard for me to imagine having so much silver that it becomes as common as pavement. But the scriptures are real clear. That's how prosperous Israel was during the time of, of Solomon. The temple was just loaded with gold. There was gold everywhere. The, the, the nation was in unity. They were moving ahead. They were just making unbelievable progress. And then Solomon gets near the end of his life and he turns it over to his son Rehoboam and within a year, 83% of the kingdom is gone. Within a year, Egypt starts to threaten. So Rehoboam, Solomon's son, starts to realize, hey, I'm in big trouble. I'm not prepared in order to meet the Egyptians. I've already lost all but 17% of the kingdom because they've defected to the north. I don't have the, the military wherewithal now to withstand Egypt, so he strips the temple of its gold, he strips the city of its gold, and gives it all to the Egyptians in order to pay them off so they won't invade. Within a year, 
Everything that Solomon worked for, all the dominance, all the prominence, all the, the, the status, gone. Keep that in mind as we read this text. I've forgotten who's uh, reading this. this Buddy! Please listen very, very carefully as Buddy reads this text from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. Please rise if you're able. Sorry. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 17 through 23. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. May the Lord now add meaning and blessing to his work. You may be seated. Isn't it fun to read Ecclesiastes and have such happy text in order to build everything off of? Listen, folks, this is reality. I grew up very, very sheltered. In fact, I didn't realize how sheltered I was until I got out in the real world when I had my own business and got away from my my Christian school that I was a part of, my, my Christian family, my Christian place, yeah, mother and father. And, and my, I was born and raised in a farm where two miles in every direction was my aunts, my uncles, my grandpa. And, and I was protected and insulated from the world. And so I grew up with a, with a keen understanding that we work the ground in order to produce fruit that God had, wants us to produce in order to feed mankind. Everything that we did, we saw as significant. We saw as eternal. We saw as being something very, very valuable for the world. And then I opened a guitar store. And I ran that guitar store for 12 years. And inevitably, every Friday night, I would have customers who had just got their paycheck coming in, buying some new music, buying some uh, new strings or a new guitar or a new effect or something in order to give their life meaning for the weekend so they could go back to work on Monday. I knew of several of them who would buy several cases of beer and drink them in the course of the two-day weekend that they had just to make sure they could have some relief from the toil that they were going to have to endure by going back to work. That was a foreign concept to me. I didn't understand that kind of torment that people had to go through week in and week out, week in and week out, just to survive. Here's a question we're going to be looking at if you want to follow along in the sermon line. What is Koheleth? Koheleth is, an, is a Hebrew word for uh, Ecclesiastes, for the, the preacher, the one who's writing this book. What is Koheleth trying to tell us about work? I believe he's trying to tell this. Without, work without reference to God is both meaningless and cruel. It not only makes sacrificial demands on your life, but in the end your work is all for someone else who will benefit from your toil. Unless we can find a way to discover profit or meaning from some other source, capital S, that is not a mistake. Unless we can find a way to discover profit or meaning from some other source, work will forever be a curse. I have a little uh, comparison between work and prison that I'd like to give you all. In prison, you spend the majority of your time in an 8x10 cell. At work, you spend most of your time in a 6x8 cubicle. In prison, you get three meals a day. At work, you get only a break for one meal, and then you have to pay for it. In prison, you get time off for good behavior. At work, you get rewarded with, with, for good behavior with more work. In prison, you can watch TV and play games. At work, you get fired for watching TV and playing games. In prison, you get your own toilet. At work, you have to share. In prison, you're, you're allowed to see your family and friends. At work, 
You can't even speak to your family and friends. In prison, there are wardens who are often sadistic. At work, they're called managers. In prison, you spend most of your time looking out through the bars, wanting to get out. At work, you spend most of your time looking out, wanting to get to a bar. And some of you free Methodists are going, oh, Pastor Keith, lighten up. I'll never forget the day Santa Claus died in our household. And it has to do with Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 27 through, uh, verses, yeah, 27 through, 17 through 23. Giving all your efforts to someone else who just takes it from you. My wife loves to shop. She loves to think about what, uh, I'm, you know, I shop on the 24th. Just whatever I need to do in order to get it off my list. Yeah, some of you ladies are going, Pastor Keith. I'm a guy. <laughs> My wife loves to shop. She loves to, to think through what people would like and, and you know, look and look for hours and hours and hours. Which... <laughs> and when she finds just the right item, she can't wait to give it to them in order for them to really, really find delight and pleasure in the gift that she's bought for them. How many of you can relate to that? How many of you have no clue at all what I'm speaking about? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Four honest males. <laughs> this particular Christmas, my oldest daughter, Jody, was three years old. And my wife put the mistake, had made the mistake of putting on the present to Jody from Santa. Jody got the present, absolutely loved the present, just thanked Santa over and over again for the gift. And Jean said, you know I bought that for you. And Jody said, no, this gift is from Santa. And we tried to convince her that the gift really was from us, and she was not able to be considered. Listen, Santa died that day. <laughs> we aren't going to have any guy in a red suit who's overweight and underworked stealing all of our glory. <laughs> and that's the way a lot of you feel. You feel like you're working for someone else and you really can't get ahead. You really can't get the raise you deserve. You really don't get the recognition that should be yours. Why are you worried about it? Who are you working for? Why do you do what you do? Because if you're doing it for Christ, it really shouldn't matter. The word for the day is toil. <laughs> if you look up toil in the dictionary, it's exactly the perfect word for looking at what Ecclesiastes has to tell us. Long, hard, tiring labor. So cheer up! We've got an adventure to go on here. Here we go. Number one. Why does Koheleth hate life? Why does the writer of Ecclesiastes hate life? Because everything without God ends up being meaningless. That's really the basis of the whole book. If you take God out of the picture, then who gives a rep? Look what he says in verses seven, uh, 20, 21 through 23. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chaf chasing after the wind. What does a man get for his toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. Because the writer of Ecclesiastes has understood that once he dies, the value system of this world, that the uh, currency of this world will long, no longer be relevant. You will never find a U-Haul behind a hearse. You, you can't take it with you. It's kind of like the guys at the end of the Civil War who were invading Richmond, and they, when they invaded Richmond, came across a huge stash of uh, Confederate currency. And so that night, they played poker with this huge stash of uh, Confederate currency, and one guy made out with a million dollars. How much was it worth? Nothing. Because the Confederacy was on its way out, and soon the whole uh, value system, the whole currency of the Confederate system was not going to be worth anything. Folks, please understand that in the game of life, if you want to look at it that way, in the game of life, the currency will one day be worth nothing. 
the writer of Ecclesiastes understands this and he realizes, holy cow, there's got to be something beyond this world. And that's what causes him to search. That's what causes him to look at himself and at his world and realize that without God, his life really is meaningless. Number two, why does Koheleth say that our toil without God is meaningless? Because all you do is anxiously strive for the sake of another. (laughs) And who knows how he's going to turn out. And I really believe Solomon had an inclination about how his son Rehoboam was going to fare as king of of Israel, king of Judah. Look what he says, verses uh, 18 through 23. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a rich man, a wise man, or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. I am so glad that I have understood what Solomon is trying to get us to understand. That if you're living only to get prestige or money or position or reputation in this world, it's empty. But if you understand that you're working for the God of the universe and you're working for his kingdom to come on earth and you're working for eternal rewards that God is storing up for you in heaven, then everything you do has significance and meaning and purpose. And that's a lot of what I'm hoping you you will understand. And the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to get us to realize that if we put all of our eggs in this world, in this basket, you're really doing what one uh, English writer had put on his tombstone, you're only plowing water. That's what an English writer had put on his tombstone. I only plowed water. I'm a farmer. Not anymore. But at one time I was a farmer. And we turned the ground over and we plowed the, the ground in order to, to take the, uh, the, the stubble and that things left over from the previous co- uh, crop, turn it down on bring new ground up and allow it to uh, percolate over the winter months in order for it to be ready the next spring in order to plant to have good crops. But plowing water? What happens when you plow water? Ten seconds after you've done it, no effect. Nothing. I want to show you this next slide. A cemetery with a man working, uh, men working sign by it. I got this from a commentary that the entire commentary on Ecclesiastes is nothing but pictures with the the Ecclesiastes text. And this was from this section of scripture. I think it's uh, very thought-provoking. What are you working for? What's the end of your work? What's it going to mean? What's it going to mean 10 minutes after you're gone? I'd like to read a a passage from Tim Keller talking about how we strive so hard to make a difference and why, what's the motivation of why we do that? This is what he has to say. It should be in your sermon outline if you'd like to follow it. It's under, under point number two. There is something wrong in our heart. Fundamentally, the reason you are working is because there is something wrong with your heart. The thing you are actually manufacturing is not a product. You are manufacturing a self You don't know who you are. You are trying to prove yourself. And the work is never about others. It's always about you. In your work, you are trying to prove that you are somebody special, somebody real. As C.S. Lewis says, in your work, you're really saying, I'm as good as you. Why are you working? If you're working to advance yourself, if you're working to advance your own agenda, then folks, it's really going to be vain. It's really going to be empty. Because when you die, you'll have nothing to carry on. You'll have nothing to to, uh, invest in for eternity. I'd like to show you this. This is a Strong's Concordance, a real one. I showed in the first service my, my copy, which is a little bit smaller. Same contents, but six point. This has about, uh, about eight point font in it. This is about, oh, let's see here. Wow, this is a much more involved one. This is about 1,500 pages. Mr. Strong's, Mr. Strong uh, worked his entire life to catalog every word in the King James Bible. 
Every word. I mean, a, the, and, but, every word. And gave reference to it. So if you wanted to find out where the word light appears, you can look in here and find out. And folks, I lived off of this for about 10 years of my life when I was doing Bible study. This is before computers. Yes, I am before computers. <laughs> he spent his whole life just going through the, the Bible and cataloging every single word. Do you know how long it takes today to find out any word and where it's referenced? About four seconds. Because a Bible program, you can just type your word in there, hit search, and you can find any ra range of search that you want to find in a matter of seconds, maybe even less than seconds. Was his work down the drain? Was his work meaningless? No. If for no other reason than it changed my life forever, I am eternally grateful to Mr. Strong and his concordance. Even though today it's obsolete and irrelevant, he in his work, his lifetime work, made my study so much easier and made my uh, investigations into the scriptures so much more fruitful because I didn't have access to a computer in 1979. I didn't have access to a computer when I was doing my end time study for a Sunday school class that started out six months and ended up three years. I didn't have a chance to be able to, to, be able to do all this work myself. Do you understand that your work, no matter what it is, if you do it for the God's kingdom and you do it for his glory, it can be eternally significant. Even though, two years from now, it may be totally obsolete. That's the really, really cool part about working for the God of the universe. I, I'd like to read this quote. Um, if you get a, go to the online uh, resources, it didn't make the cut as far as your... Uh, the sermon outline you have in your hand. You have to go to the sermon outlines that are online. It's from a kind of a second-rate theologian by the name of Pastor Keith. He had this to say. If your work is all about you, if you work to fill a hole in your life, there will always be a hole because work cannot permanently fill the hole in your life. Only God can fill a God-shaped vacuum in your life, Pascal. But if you go to work to experience God's pleasure, doing what God created you to do to accomplish what God desires for you to accomplish, if you go to work to fulfill God's purposes in your life, if you go to work to glorify God, then your work can provide the permanent, meaningful profit or satisfaction that you ultimately desire. Here's the kicker. There's two ways you can do your work. You can either do it to earn a paycheck... You can either do it to uh, establish a reputation. You can either do it in order to give significance to your life, or you can do it to feel God's pleasure. I double dog dare you to go home and, and get, get chariots of fire. If you own it, great. If you don't, rent it. And if you've never watched it, oy vey, where have you been? Chariots of Fire is about two athletes who are training for the Olympics. One is a, a one, well, they're actually both 100 meter runners. And uh, one of them says, Abram says, I run to justify my existence. I have 10 seconds in which to justify my existence. And if I don't win, I'm not worthy to be on this planet. The other one runs, not so much to win, not so much to, to, uh, to gain glory, not too much to get endorsements for products. But when I run, Eric Little says, I feel his pleasure. Do you work with that same attitude? Do you work to justify your existence so I can earn a paycheck, so I can buy the nicer car, so I can get the nicer home, so I can impress my Joneses down the street? Who are the Joneses anyway? <laughs> Hopefully if you're Jones here today, you're tired of that burden of always having people try to look up to you. <laughs> or are you living because you feel God's pleasure, because you know you're doing what the God of the, of the universe, you're doing what he created you to do? A huge difference on how you're going to approach your work. And folks, the only way you'll ever have life that is really life is 
understand it in that cosmic terms, if you understand it, that you're doing your work because the God of the universe created you to do this work. And I don't care if it's anywhere from a homemaker raising up children up to a, a CEO of a major corporation. It doesn't make any difference. You've got to understand what you're doing in this divine cosmic uh, context or you're going to be frustrated. That Seeing it in a divine context is the only way to have life that is truly life. A couple of quotes I want to bring out to you. One is by St. Augustine. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in thee, O Lord. You will be always churning over in your sleep, trying to figure out ways to advance, trying to figure out ways to get, get ahead because you're trying to justify your existence and your work. Or you can work with all your heart feeling God's pleasure. And I'll, I'll bet this, you'll do better work with the way God wants us to approach it than you ever will feeling the pressure and the stress and the toil of doing your work in order for you to get ahead. The second one is from uh, Blaise Pascal. I made reference to it earlier. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any other created thing, but only by God, the Creator, made known through Jesus. Okay, here's point number three. How does Jesus redeem work? By showing us that our work can be for a transcendent divine good that will ultimately be for our eternal profit. That's why I had read what, we, what Professor Turner read earlier from John chapter 6. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Do you understand by, by, that by realizing what we have in eternal life with Jesus, that all of our work here in this world now has significance in the next world? That it's not this world and done. That there's this, in fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, every word that we speak, every thought that we have will have eternal divine significance and will be held accountable for every word we speak. Listen, if we're held accountable for every word we speak, we'll certainly be held accountable for our work. What are you working for? Who are you doing it for? If you see your work as a divine calling, if you see that you're doing the work that you're doing because God has gifted you to do what you're supposed to be doing and you're producing something in order to make life better for the rest of mankind, you're taking dominion of this world which God commanded us to do in Genesis chapter 2 and was reiterated in Psalm chapter 8 that we had for our call to worship today. If you'll see that your work is part of God's plan that you're to work with him in order to allow heaven to come down here on earth, it can redeem us. It can redeem the world. But our problem is we say, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. That's death. There's no vision there. There's no hope there. There was a study that was done a number of years ago, a, a, a place where they make airplanes, maybe Boeing or you know, Lockheed or someplace like that, and they told half of the workers that they were working just to get a paycheck. You produce this particular product. They told the other half of the workers, you're developing a brand new aircraft that will allow it to be uh, uh, about 20% faster and it will be uh, more economical for the customers so people that want to fly around and visit their families, it will be cheaper for them to do this. This is leading edge technology and you're developing it. You're working on it in order to make the world a better place for all the people that are riding on it. Guess who did the better work? The second group. The group that had a vision of how their work and how their product and how their production was making a difference in the world. Folks, you've got to do that yourself. Your employer may not come to you and show you how valuable your work is in order for the, the world to be able to operate better and more efficiently. A lot of you that are blue-collar workers have probably never been told that. Shame on your employer. And if you're an employer, shame on you. We've got to have a vision of what our work is doing. We've got to understand what our place is in this world and what, what a difference it makes. If you make a little bitty widget that goes in a car door in order for the windows go up, make it with all your might. Make it with the best efficiency you can because the cheaper you can make it, the more efficient your production, the cheaper the car and the product's going to be for someone that's your next door neighbor. Maybe even for you. 
I, there's one guy here in the church that his whole job is to scrap out metal because of poor production. That's his whole job. Just to scrap out metal. Oy vey. That much waste. That much inefficiency. That much, oh, just ram it through the press and get it done. No vision. No heart. No understanding of the divine significance of your work. If you seek to be great, you'll never achieve it. Greatness comes as a byproduct of serving something or someone greater than you regard yourself. Of all people, that comes from Rush Limbaugh. I have a seminary professor. I want to read this other quote. It's under point number three. And folks, this is what I'm trying to capture. Hopefully you'll be able to capture it as well. The great king has summoned each of us into his throne room. This time, however, he is not entrusting jewels to us. Rather, he is distributing property. Take this portion of my kingdom, he says. I am making you my steward over your office, over your workbench, over your kitchen stove, over your production line, over your teaching position, over your studies, over your work. Put your heart into mastering this part of my world. Get it in order. Unearth its treasures. Do all you can with it. Then everybody will see what a glorious king I am. That's why we get up every morning and go to work. We don't labor simply to survive. Insects do that. Our work is an honor, a privileged commission from our great king. And I can tell by your faces, you're going, nice try, Pastor Keith. <laughs> then I feel sorry for you. Your work will consume your soul. I watched it happen in the music store that I worked at. I watched it happen with some of you who absolutely hate your work. You hate your studies. You hate the effort you have to put out. That'll kill you. God sent his son into the world so that we might have life in its abundance. So that we might see our work as valuable. We might see our work as significant. And your work is if you could just see it the way God sees it. And you'll never see it the way God sees it unless you have the mind of Christ. Unless you seek his mind. You seek his understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, especially your work. Lean on him. And he will give you the understanding to make your path straight. William Barclay had this to say. It's also in your sermon outline. All human things are trivial if they exist for nothing beyond themselves. The real value of anything depends on its aim. This is so insightful. If we eat simply for the sake of eating, we become gluttons. And it is likely to do for us far more harm than good. If we eat to sustain life, to do our work better, to maintain the fitness of our bodies at the highest peak, food has a real significance. If a man spends a great deal of time on sport simply for the sake of sport, he is at least, to some extent, wasting his time. But if he spends that time in order to keep his body fit and thereby to do his work for God and for men better, sport ceases to be trivial and becomes important. The things of the flesh all gain their value from the spirit in which they are done. That is good. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I don't care if you eat or drink or whatever you do. Do it all to the glory of God. I don't care if you're a factory worker 
or a secretary or a CEO or a salesman or a preacher. Do what you do for the glory of God. Feel his pleasure in being able to use the gifts that he's given you. Feel God's pleasure as you're able to produce something and manage the, the, the universe God has given us and placed us in in order to make a difference in the world. Listen, folks, this world becomes a jungle if it's no longer maintained and, and operated the way God wants it to be operated. Remember, the world at the beginning was a garden. And when the garden becomes untended and unorganized and the work is not put in it in order to keep it structured, it soon becomes a jungle. In fact, we often say, it's a jungle out there. You were created to bring order and structure to the universe, to your part of the world, so that it might be redeemed. And mankind in your presence and in your, under your realm of influence could benefit from your work. And you've got to see it that way. Or it'll kill you. Worship point is this. Acknowledge that God deems your life as a significant component of his providence. Everything you do is for him. To recognize this is to worship God in his providence, sovereignty, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, love, compassion, forgiveness, and mercy. To not recognize this is to have all your toil and labor be empty, meaningless, and without ultimate profit. My spiritual challenge is this. See God's love for you and his desire for us to enjoy life that is truly life by, by comprehending our place in his world. A place where our work and toil is eternally significant and our significance is not found in our sinful, puny, temporal, selfish efforts, but in his. I'd like to close with two illustrations. First one is from, uh, actually I used it about uh, nine months ago or so. In this particular uh, evening, Paderewski, the great pianist, was having a concert. And uh, as Paderewski was backstage getting ready, a, a, a young mother who was sitting near the front and her little boy who played piano, or was just learning piano, were waiting for Paderewski to come on the stage. When the mother got involved in a conversation with one of the, the next door people, and so she was so involved in the conversation, she re failed to realize that her son, her, her young seven or eight-year-old son, had gone up on stage and was now approaching the piano. And in fact, just as he got to the piano, the lights came up, the curtains came open, and there's a little boy on the piano plinking out, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, dun, dun, dun. And the mother went, oh no, my child is up there on the stage. And Paderewski came onto the stage. And she just slunk down in her chair going, oh, this is horrible. And the little boy kept going along playing over and over again, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And Paderewski came up to the little boy and said, don't stop. Keep playing. And then with the bass line, it went. And he just kept going over it. And the little boy kept. <laughs> and when they were done, they brought the house down. Why? Because the little boy was so good? <laughs> no. But because the master was able to take his puny little efforts and show his glory by working in cooperation with his puny little efforts. Folks, what I'm doing for you on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights is a puny little effort. But when the God of the universe comes and accompanies it, the next is a apocryphal story that uh, was created by Elizabeth Elliot. You'll remember Elizabeth Elliot as being the wife of the martyred uh, missionary Jim Elliot. And Elizabeth Elliot uh, expressed this, uh, this story, a fictitious story, one that she had created. Apostle Peter was walking along with the rest of the disciples, and one day Jesus asked the disciples all to pick up a rock and to carry it for him. And so he she picked up, uh, he picked up a rock and carried him along. And, and about noontime, they stopped to rest for a little while. And Jesus said, bring me your rock. And as each disciple brought Jesus the rock that they had carried for him, he turned it into bread and gave it back to them. And they thought, whoa, cool. 
And they all ate their bread and they enjoyed it. And then finally Jesus said, okay, boys, I want you to pick up another rock for me and want you to carry it for me as well. And so they all picked up the rock and Peter, he's no dummy, he's, he got this huge, big boulder. And he goes, I'll carry this for you, Lord. And they carried it all the way about, about to eight or nine miles until they got to the Jordan River. And they were going to spend the rest of the night there. And Jesus said, boys, I want you to bring your rocks to me. And Peter went, here it is. I've been dragging this thing around for the last eight miles. I can't wait to get my meal for tonight. And Jesus said, I want you to throw it in the Jordan. And Peter, Jesus! And Jesus said, Peter, I asked you to pick up a rock and carry it for me. For who were you carrying your rock? For who are you doing your work? Let's pray. God, help us. We feel so cheated when we don't make money that our next door neighbor is making. We feel so insignificant when we don't get the raise and we know that we deserved it. Why are we working? God help us. Help us to do what we do to build your kingdom for your honor and for your glory. Help us to take to heart the words of Jesus when he asked us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness then everything else will take care of itself. God, help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.